Okay, we're continuing going through the collection. This is Tuesday, June the 25th, and today we're going to pretty much finish off um, this little journey through this, the artifacts and uh, the materials that I've collected over the many years. Let's start off on the top shelf, and all of these are going to be packaged tomorrow, starting tomorrow, and the packages we put them in will ideally have pictures of what goes in the box that we put it in, plus a box number. And I will make duplicates of the pictures that I take of those boxes and the numbers so that the duplicates, will, one of them will be pasted on the box, the other one will serve as a catalog of what we've put away. Starting at the top, the object that you can barely see probably, the black object up there is what is known as a cork softener. It may have another more official name, but basically that was in our laboratory for years when we used to dispense products in corked bottles and it was also used in the chemistry laboratories for the same reason to soften corks that went into uh, test tubes and so on, but basically it's a cork softener. Behind it, I think, is a balance. I can't really tell from here. It looks like it might be an old Tremner or Torsion balance, a pharmacy balance from way back. It could be some other things. Moving across then, we have some mason jars, uh, which I don't ordinarily collect but they were given to me maybe 25 or 30 years ago from a raided drug laboratory in Berkeley and they had one time stored, um, shall we say, illegal substances but because they stored them in these antique bottles I couldn't find it in my heart once I emptied them out to throw them away. Um, if we continue panning along that top shelf uh, on the right here you will see a series of uh, antique pharmacy bottles Basically, these were stock bottles of chemicals that the pharmacist used to compound, that is, to put together various types of drug products, uh, an ingredient at a time. We call that compounding uh, in pharmacy. And so, therefore, these were the most commonly prescribed drugs, or at least they were commonly prescribed in the pharmacy in which they were, they were held. But you will see such things on that shelf, and you probably can't see it, is Ipecac and Opium, Business of Gallate, I don't know what the next one is, EVACU, evacuant or something, potassium iodide, and so on. I'm going to show you the characteristics of these labels because they're all the same regardless of the size of the bottle. Those are known as glass-coated labels. Now the label itself is made out of paper. And basically, you, and the paper itself has gold leaf around the edge of it. And either by machine, uh, these names, in this particular case, tincture, of Goyachi, whatever that is, I think it's Guayacol, uh, in this particular case was put on there by machine or in cases where the pharmacist just bought the blank, he or she would put it on the name of the product on there by hand. The characteristic of this label is these little, I don't know what to call them, rays that operate in the center point and stream out. These you usually find on bottles made by the Whitehall Tatum Company although this is not one such that I can see. You usually see a marking on the bottom. This bottle is probably about 120 years old, and it goes back to a time when pharmacists would purchase 20, 30, or 40 of these, and they would come as sets uh, of pre-configured mixtures of chemicals that were commonly prescribed. So those bottles have on them glass labels, that ray gold leaf that I talked about, um, and the reason uh, I called it a glass label is because the label itself, being made out of paper, is then covered by a clear piece of glass. And in some instances, the pharmacist could buy these labels with the paper already mounted, and then they would use shellac or some other ingredient, this one is for a round bottle, uh, to mount it to the surface of the bottle, and the surface is indented. So whenever you see a bottle with an indented surface, you know that was a bottle made to hold one of these glass-covered labels. The purpose of the glass label was basically to protect the printed material below from being contaminated by whatever was in the bottle. <clears throat> um, pharmacists were always taught to pour away from the label, never to pour toward the label, because theoretically it could drip down and so on. But if any pharmacist and apprentice forgot that, or somebody else spilt some stuff on it while refilling the bottle, the glass coating sealed in there with shellac and some other things would protect the label from being stained. At that, as you will see, some of these labels are stained. The problem with these labels is that they're very fragile, as you can see. Anyway, so well, let's get it back up here to the shelf. Moving across, we have a lot of bottles up there, many without labels that have fallen off over the years. I never had them. Moving down to this shelf, you will see more of those bottles. 
these bottles came to me from various sources. These are not original School of Pharmacy bottles. They came to me from various sources. Pharmacists who had a pharmacy in a gold rush town and it closed down and so they wanted to get rid of their bottles. Local pharmacists who collected them and some pharmacists who strictly, who frankly just inherited them when they bought an old pharmacy. As happened with the pharmacy that was up in Woodland, California that donated a substantial number of bottles. Most of these bottles came from an alumnus. I wish I could tell you his name. I had it on my brain yesterday. Maybe I'll think of it later uh, so I can even actually give you the where they came from for most of those small ones. Uh, they were the only small ones over the years that were ever donated, so they're quite unique as far as I'm concerned. We have different kinds of bottles here now, moving down a little bit, with a different kind of gold label. This is a metallic label entirely, with uh, manufactured by a different company, and you'll always find a marking on the bottom. Uh, this is a relatively new blow-molded bottle. Relatively new means maybe a hundred years old. The older bottles were blown by hand and you will find, I don't even remember what they call it, but when a bottle is blown by hand, there's a rod that's stuck to the bottom of the bottle and they spin it around and then shape it. And when they separate the bottle, it leaves behind a mark where the, where the glass was separated from it. And there's a name for it. Glass blowers have a name for it. Again, I do not remember what it is. So continuing across, we see more bottles of this kind, and you'll find these actually around the room in various locations, simply because until recently, these, these shelves were filled to capacity. What I've known in the meantime is several members of the faculty have asked and have received a, a bottle or two and have deplenished the, have reduced the, the number I have by that. Next, uh, the next shelf down, we move into a whole variety of drugs obtained much the same way as the bottles uh, over the many, many years of pharmacists. Uh, if you know anything about the history of pharmacists, pharmacy, you will know that old-time pharmacists never threw anything away. They just simply collected it until it molded and fell apart on the shelves. And so therefore, when a pharmacist bought an old pharmacy, he or she would usually inherit quite a stock of old drugs that were no longer good. Some of them were just shoved in boxes and put up in attics. Then the pharmacists themselves collected them and stored them in varying conditions, stored them in the pharmacy, sometimes in the garage, in one case out in the side yard, uh, unprotected. And obviously, so you'll find these bottles are in various states of deterioration. Some of them are very well preserved, other ones the labels are falling apart. A lot of them are falling apart just strictly due to age because of the acid papers used basically make the, the, uh, the uh, labels and such things more brittle. So you'll find in here packaged materials like, like uh, bulk materials, like this thing called red gum made by Lilly. Um, this was used by pharmacists for compounding purposes. You will find tablets. You will find a transition from corked bottles, such as this particular product here, which is actually, again, a compounding chemical and not necessarily, a, and not a pill bottle, to metallic lids, uh, uh, which was the next step of evolution. Screw lids are made out of metal to um, to lids that are plastic materials. This was the very first material. Again, I am getting so old, I'm forgetting what they called it, a black material. Do you remember what the first black plastic was called? Okay, anyway, this material, to ultimately the plastic screw on lids. Um, and so you will find all those kinds of bottles here. I, my collection was not discreet. I basically took anything that anybody put in a box and gave to me, so you'll find <coughs> mixed in here some strange things like gauze absorbent gauze. <coughs> you will find a fire extinguisher, an old-fashioned fire extinguisher, probably a hundred years old. <coughs> you will find tooth powder and you will find all sorts of pills and remedies that were sold over the counter, some of them going back many, many, many years. Um, uh, like this product here. This one is quite, quite old. And inevitably, on these labels, you will find claims of the era. That is, the era may have been pre-1900s, in which they claimed that this one product was good for all sorts of things. Consumption, coughs, colds, hoarseness, croup, whooping cough, asthma, bronchitis, and diseases of the lungs and throat. Um, and this particular thing, like almost things like it, uh, didn't contain a whole lot of anything. The bottle is quite elegant. Dr. Van Wert's balsam, this is called. Um, because it has uh, oil of balsam in it. Anyway, so we have more of those here. I even, uh, as I said, it's an electric co a collection. It has such things as needles uh, from the days when needles were not disposable. These are the reusable needles of the 
early 19th century, early 8th to 20th century up to about the 1980s when the disposable syringes came in. These are just the, the points in various gauges, the needle points that fit onto syringes. You will find syringes here. You will find um, an old, old, old syringe like that going back to well into the late 1800s, I'm fairly certain. Um, and you will find uh, syringes uh, actually spread around this collection. Syringes made out of glass, uh, big syringes, small syringes, syringes like that. All of these things required a prescription at the time they were sold, and so therefore they were not things that you'd ordinarily find around the household unless the patient was a diabetic. Uh, but as I said, there's a pretty full collection of needles and sizes there. Moving across, we have more of the same uh, chemicals from laboratories. So uh, this is probably only 50 years old. We have some OTC products, tincture of methylate, what pharmacists would call wets and dries. They had a wets and dry section composed of all sorts of things like methylate, bay rum, camphorated water, all sorts of things like that that they either bought uh, commercially prepared in later years or prepared it themselves or bought it in gallon containers and then poured it into much smaller containers, which is what a pharmacist did that I'll show you on the shelf I have that, that, that is basically filled with labels that he used for products that he had re-poured from a giant container into a smaller container and then placed it, his label on them. So continue, we have more of the same, almost a complete selection here of Humphreys products. Humphreys are uh, homeopathic products. Uh, they, they uh, I, I won't go into the theory of homeopathy. If you want to look it up, do it. I've crossed swords with homeopathists a couple of times and they have some interesting claims. In any event, these are all of Humphreys products. Um, and they too have gone through an evolutionary phase. They, the, simp the most complicated phase is when the, the product came totally wrapped in paper. If I were to open this package, there's another package inside, and then there's a corked bottle containing Humphrey's homeopathic number two. Humphrey made a series of products which he gave a number. Uh, the products came with a guidebook that pharmacists had on hand, so if you had, uh, if you had a sore throat, you took Humphrey's number X, and it would tell you that if he had asthma, you would take another product. It had a lot of products for women and what they called women's ailments, um, specific for things related to the menses and so on. That's Humphrey's. It evolved from this wrap package into packages that were basically more like the ones we see today, uh, uh, either a sealed or a pliable up container made out of cardboard on the outside with the product on the inside. So we go back to before the turn of the century, I think, with the wrap packages, and I have no idea when the, uh, the unwrapped packages came in. The more of those ingredients along here, again, a little bit of everything, some, some powder, some uh, tincture of iodine, not so old, maybe 25 to 30, 40 years old, um, and Styrax, I think, is the name of that black material. But, and um, lozenges, and so on. Um, in fact, and some, and even some ampules. You will find uh, various ampules here. This one is for a digitalis product. Uh, and these products came ordinarily with a blade that was used to scratch on the surface of the ampule. And then the, the uh, physician or the pharmacist would break off the lid of the container, the lid of the ampule, and put it into a syringe. Not terribly sterile, but that persisted well into the uh, 20, 21st century, the use of ampules like that. Um, and as I say, I collected these from various sources, just stuff that they had and, and got tired of and put in boxes and passed on to me. So there was no, I was not selective. I became selective only in later years when it was obvious I was simply duplicating materials that I already had and I frankly didn't want to spend the time driving as I had done in many cases to Woodland, to Los Angeles, to uh, various places around California to collect this. Moving down further, we have some books that I've collected over the years, donated uh, almost a complete set of what's known as the National Formulary, which is a book of um, basically in the beginning a recipe book, but later on became a book of standards for the purity of various pharmaceuticals. It was in the very beginning a book of standards of purity. When you bought stramonium and were going to make stramonium extract, the National Formulary or the United States Pharmacopeia, which is another book called the USP, basically an abbreviation, 
gave pharmacists instructions on how to test their products for purity. So uh, you bought your seronium from somebody and they learned that if you threw in about 20 fistfuls of straw per bale, you probably could gain a little bit more money, earn a little bit more money, and so pharmacists were trained in those days, although they probably never used it, to analyze the, uh, the, the herbs and the, the, uh, the herb materials they bought uh, prior to extraction, prior to using them in products to see whether they were contaminated, uh, and a, a lot of them were in those days. Contamination was a big deal. I will show you a sign later that said the Park Davis drug uses pure and fresh ingredients, which uh, Park Davis a pharmaceutical manufacturer. If we move down the shelf, and I'll, I don't remember if I've talked about this before, I will talk about it again. Uh, we have uh, just various remedies. We have uh, a pill roller, because pharmacists made pills in those days and actually took the soft material that they had acquired from it and placed it on a hard surface and rolled it into a round pill. These are called pastilles and these are in early dosage forms. These predate capsules. They definitely predate uh, tablets. And they're made out of unleavened bread. Basically a pharmacist would scoop in an amount of drug and into the, the top part of it, moisten the other part and bring the two pieces together and because it was made out of bread they would seal. These are called cachets. There's another name for them. Again, I don't remember that name. Uh, I have a device here that is a machine for putting them together. Um, and cachets were used commonly in France, but as I say, they predated, they're a divided dosage form. They were the earliest of divided dosage forms. Um, so we have then more materials. We have suppository molds uh, uh, given to our graduates of uh, the 40s and the 50s by a company. I don't know why they gave them suppository molds, but they did. Um, and those machines that came with it never really worked very well. I have somewhere around here three or four of them. Continuing down along this shelf then, we have just more of the same. Very, just a potpourri of materials. Somebody gave me their stamping machine. Pharmacists in those days would stamp every prescription with a number and then transcribe that number to a um, the prescription label and then file the prescription by the number they stamped on it. Uh, and that probably is oh, a hundred year old stamping machine. Then we have some miscellaneous materials here that have nothing to do with us uh, now. They had something to do with pharmacists who were manufacturing pharmacists who wanted to measure the density of their, li li of their liquids. These are hydrometers made in Germany and they're basically to, to measure specific gravity. Um, then moving down this shelf to the bottom um, you will see more bottles. You'll see some of these bottles whose labels have fallen off again over time that shellac they use uh, is decays or eaten away. I have no idea what happens to it and the labels will fall off, sometimes causing damage to the label. Here's three or four of them, at least two labels anywhere for glycerin and syrup of uh, figs, syrup of pretty v v the wine made out of figs. Um, which probably will fit a number of the bottles I have. Then down at the very bottom is a suppository machine, a white all tatum suppository machine, basically a device in which pharmacists would make what was known as compression suppositories. This machine was uh, donated by an alumnus about 30 years ago. Uh, it's a very nice machine in that it has a lot of its original markings. I should say we probably have about eight of these machines in storage in, in uh, Oyster Point. Because we used them until 1997, we taught it kind of like a historical course on how to compound, and we taught it as it had been taught for 100 years. It was strictly a history course on how to prepare dosage forms, antique ones, and we included in it how to ma manufacture compression suppositories. Basically what's behind here is pretty much what you'll see to the right and left of it. Uh, so these are labels collected from Klinkner's Pharmacy. We have actually the graduation diploma of, uh, I think it's Fred Frederick Klinkner over here someplace. Um, he was a graduate of the school. I guess he was a graduate of school. I couldn't find him listed in the alumni rosters, but I guess he was. I know for certain his son was or his grandson, one or the other. His son, um, our grandson, lived over in the East Bay, and he donated not only that machine, but all of these boxes. And each of these boxes has something in it. And remember earlier I mentioned pharmacists did wets and dries. They would buy things in bulk, and they would repackage them uh, in smaller containers. This uh, 
This is carbolic acid. Um, and the pharmacist who sold these, would, Klinkner's pharmacist, uh, Fred Klinkner, would, would pour them into bottles, smaller bottles, maybe bottles not much bigger than that, some maybe that big, and then glue on his label and put them in his wet and dry section and sell them. A lot of pharmacists did that because it was cheaper to buy the bulk product than it was to buy the package product. But, uh, and manpower in those days was pretty cheap, so it would made economic sense for them to do so. <coughs> Down at the bottom here we have a suppository mold. My guess is that this is a vaginal suppository mold. It's certainly not intended for, for the anus. It could be a horse suppository. <coughs> it's made out of brass. Would would pick up a lot of money for somebody down at one of the scrap metal places. Uh, it weighs, I don't know, three, four pounds. Uh, but basically these are molds that were used to make suppositories via a fusion method, meaning they melted the ingredients as opposed to the compression method shown in that machine that I talked about earlier the white altata machine that was made by compression you use cold ingredients the colder the better this one you melted the cocoa butter which was the common ingredient <coughs> and poured it into molds then down there is more of the same some labels from the Klinkner pharmacy olive oil he sold the darndest things so these are olive oil labels and I don't know what that is and I won't take the time to open it up right now this <coughs> is probably the prize of the collection if I haven't mentioned it before. This is called a show glove. And if I haven't told the story before, the other day when I was recording, the show gloves go back to medieval times. When um, when f people couldn't read. And so the village had a very series of stores in it and they couldn't put out printed signs because nobody could read them anyway. So they put out some symbol that told the people when they went there what it was the store did. A butcher might have a calf's leg hanging outside. Um, a, where you could buy eggs might have some symbol of eggs. Uh, a market that sold vegetables might have a celery, an artifact of a celery, some uh, outline of a celery. Pharmacists hung show gloves, usually outside on chains. This one is on stands. Uh, this is not as old as medieval times. Um, and it was basically, it said to the people, I am a pharmacy, so come here. And I've been told whether I know it, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that during times of plague, the color of the water in the globe, because this, as you see in this globe, is actually colored water. It's not an active drug, or not gasoline, as gasoline has that color too. Um, <clears throat> the color of the water told the person whether or not there was disease present in the village, I was told. So if it was a red or some color that was gen generally recognized as being cautious, it said, move on, stranger, don't stick around there's disease in this town, and if it was some friendly color, it could have been green, I don't know. Um, people said, it basically said it's okay to stick around. Now, I don't know whether that is actually true. In fact, I've read it, uh, uh, but it uh, but it's a ni makes a nice story. So show globes originally hung on chains on the outside. Later on, I will show you some examples of ones that hang on chains. They were seldom hung on the outside, oh, probably in the starting with the 17th or 18th century on because primarily they were exposed to the elements and so people, and they were pretty and people now could read so they could put signs out that said apothecary or pharmacy and people would be able to read it. And the show globes moved inside as a symbol of the profession of pharmacy still. So you would find them in a 17th or 18th or 19th century pharmacy hanging from chains on the ceiling or maybe, <clears throat> maybe even in the window <clears throat> on a stand such as this. Now this is a uh, show, show, this is a show glove from probably 150 years old. It was acquired, used by the person who, who first bought it. And it's an, uh, it's an oval shaped one. It's not the most common. The most common shape in pharmacy is a globe. They all have a hole in top, in the top, and they all have a place to fill them with colored water. Uh, this, uh, and, and then sealed. Uh, and sealed in such a manner as to minimize, in some cases, in this case, to retard entirely, well, not quite entirely, to retard greatly the evaporation of water. As you can see, the water in here, these were always filled to the top, has evaporated this far. And I will tell you right now, it has evaporated that far in 102 years. Because this water was put in the con inside here, this dyed water was put inside here by the mother of... Um, of Roger Strange, who was one of our graduates of the class of 50, 
And she was the grand, she was the daughter of Otto Waihi, class of 1897, I believe, our class of 1897, who was a member of our faculty, who moved to Modesto, opened up a pharmacy called Waihi Drug, and bought this, and then put it in the window, and the water was put in the container by his daughter. Um, and what is, what, why is the water this color? It's that color because it could have been red. I have no idea if it's faded over time. It could have been orange. And it is the original water. Uh, everybody I've shown it to is impressed by the fact that there is no sediment and is impressed by the fact that the water is still colored. And it's probably because in those days, pharmacists used as a source of their dyes crepe paper that they could buy from any local variety store of the kind that students, it comes in streamers and we'll hang it in streamers. It comes in sheets, but it also has on its surface a very water soluble dye. Pharmacists would dip that paper in water, extract the dyes. Why they did that was I was told by another pharmacist who did it uh, when he had been a younger pharmacist was because number one, it would last, it was, sun, it was not sun sensitive, the sunlight could hit it and it wouldn't fade, or if it did fade, it would fade very gradually, and secondly, it was bacteriostatic. The kind of dyes they used in the, um, on the material were, if there were any bugs in the water they used, which was not necessarily distilled water, um, probably could have been, but not necessarily was, would kill any bugs in there, therefore you wouldn't get any growth in the, in the water because you'd think of the dye as a medium for growth, but it's just the opposite, it kills it. So this has stood the test of time. It's been in there for, since uh, 1910. Um, and the, the person who donated it about five years ago, Roger Strange, was very specific when he shipped it. He said it must be held upright, it cannot be tilted on its side. He had all these instructions, he had sent it to me in a box about three times as big as it is. Um, with all sorts of foam and padding around it, with all sorts of instructions over all sides of it, do not tilt, do not tip over. And he said he knew for a fact that this was the water that his mother put in there because when his grandfather died, uh, the, the globe passed on to Roger, and at that time his mother said, that's the water I put in there when your granddaddy first purchased the pharmacy. Um, so it's one of my prized possessions. This one is engraved. I've talked to collectors and, and they will tell you that they've, only, they've never seen an engraved oval-shaped um, show globe before. I actually have one that isn't engraved. Well, it looks just like that. Only the one I have, this is a bronze or brass one. The one I have is, um, is in pewter. The lid is in pewter. The stand is composed of pewter, or at least the chain. It's a hanging one, that's right. So it's made out of pewter rather than brass. So it's a silver coat that corrodes rather easily. Um, this has a name also, and I don't remember what it is, but it's styled after the smokestacks on Mississippi River boats. You've ever seen the, the smokestack on the top? It has these little flumes on the top of the smokestacks of river boats. It had a name. I think it's even called a flame decor, but I'm not certain. Uh, <clears throat> but in any event, so that's styled after that. And so that's the prize collection. Uh, I have no idea what it's worth. It's been estimated to be anywhere between three to nine thousand dollars in value, but I have no way of knowing. Um, before I move back to the shelf here and tell you, I've come across the the oval show globe that I described earlier. And this one's not in such great shape, but it's uh, has the same. It's the same setup as the other one, um, only rather than the base being there, it's, it's, uh, it's held to the, the, the flame or the top. And this one is one that hung from the ceiling. So this would hang in a window or somewhere in a pharmacy, again be filled with, with colored water. And uh, this is nice, was probably much prettier in the days when whatever it was that coated the pewter or the metal, that's the base metal that's there, was shiny and looks good. It probably would look good if we were to um, polish it up even now. Then there is the globe type that I described earlier. Um, and this, that's this kind. Again, this hung from the ceiling uh, by, by chains. This one uh, is one that's uh, valuable to us because it too belonged to, to an alumnus. Uh, this is um, Fred Klinker. This came out of Fred Klinker's pharmacy in Albany. It was established, I was told, in the 1870s. He took it over sometime thereafter. Um, and this one, when I received it, was just as you see it here. Um, uh, the, although in better shape, uh, not dusty. And 
However, Mr. Klinkner used an entirely different way to seal it, and it wasn't particularly a good way. What he used was the, this is a, the lid of an ointment tin. Pharmacists used to dispense ointments in tins rather than bottles. And I guess he learned that he could suppress evaporation by filling the thing with water from time to time and then place, replacing the lid with, uh, or then putting the lid on there to retard evaporation. That's the way we did it for a long time. It was hanging in the dean's office. And we had just this little ointment tin on top and we would refill it from time to time. Then there's this kind. Um, and this one comes in various kinds. It comes with a bracket around it here and can hang from the ceiling. Or it comes with a stand of this kind with a base. This one is a hang from the ceiling kind. And as you can see, the device, the globe, fits down inside there and uh, is suspended. This one has lost its elaborate top and somebody has just put a cork in it. Um, these are not terribly old. These are probably 1950s, maybe even a little bit later. Uh, I recall that <clears throat> they were available when I was a young pharmacist. If you were to purchase your, these are, these are made by Duraglass, a manufacturer at that time of um, the bottles that pharmacists dispense their prescriptions, either the containers, the pills or the tablets or the liquids in, mostly the liquids. And Duraglass had a deal that if you bought so many thousands of dollars of their bottles, uh, they would throw in uh, a, a show glove of varying sizes. They, they came very small, they got bigger, they got as big as this one. I have no idea what the, um, what the one I showed you would have required in terms of an order. But it was an, an inducement to buy their product. So it's really not very old. I don't even think it's very attractive um, because it's very crudely blown. Uh, and has lots of bubbles in it. I must admit that the one I showed you a minute ago, the one with the orange water in it, I've often wondered if it's glass. Because there's a collector down south, his name is Dr. Larry Server, I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment, who says, is it etched? Asked me how much it was etched, and I said it wasn't etched at all. And he said that's highly unusual, because water, even over a very short period of time, will etch glass. He said if you've ever dug up a piece of glass from the yard, you see the etching effects. You've ever seen something pulled out of a wreck in the ocean, water, glassware pulled out, even as recent as World War II. He said you will see uh, that it's been etched a little bit because glass is an alkaline material that has water-soluble substances in it, etc. This one is not etched, so I'm often wondered if it's made out of other materials than glass. I mean, quartz? I have no idea. I don't even know what I'm talking about. But it surprises me that it's still uh, not affected by age. Um, these two scales you see here uh, really don't belong in the collection. They were simply a joke gift given to me by a, an alumnus so many years ago. But the fact of it is, at the time he rolled them up here, he was 80 years old, and he had them on a cart, and I did not have the heart to tell him I don't want it. Um, so he unloaded this one, and I thought I was going to just get one, uh, but he shortly appeared at my door a few minutes later and he had a second one. So either of these have no, no connection to pharmacy. The man that owned them was a collector of scales, although he was a pharmacist. Uh, and this is the kind you would, used to be able to see when I was a child outside of a market, outside of a drugstore. Yeah, we, this one was an inside one. This one was an outside one. It's pretty obvious when you look at how it's been corroded. It's porcelain. It's probably 100 years old um, and it still works. People would drop a coin in and see what they weighed. Um, and, um, and as I say, it still works. Both of these still work. Um, <clears throat> of the other things that I've collected, this is not one of the more interesting. I'm not even certain what it is. So let's open it up. Uh, let's see. I, nope, just more drugs. See, I, I acquired drugs all sorts of ways. And sometimes they'd even put them in cases and give them to me like they gave this to me. So this is more drugs, more powdered ingredients. Uh, this is a very fancily wrapped package of asthma compound, Green Mountain asthma compound. And it contains five ounces of whatever that is, which could be stramonium because in those days they burned stramonium and people would inhale the fumes and theoretically get some relaxation of the smooth muscles of their bronchi. 
Um, okay, uh, so this device is a powder mixer. It has nothing to do with pharmacy. Donated by the same guy that gave me those two things. Um, it mixes bulk powders. Uh, he gave it to me because I think it has my name on it. Or at least my last name. I think it's manufactured by the Day Company or something. Um, another device that is of interest for the more regulatory minded individuals is this device here which I will just hold up momentarily because it's kind of like related to pharmacy but not an awful lot and it has an unusual purpose. Uh, this is, as you'll see, is actually an air compressor uh, but it basically has a dial on it. It can measure the amount of air that goes through it and the air comes out here and this device, this little thing screwed on top of the um, where that pipe was and I almost hate to tell you what it was because it's very disappointing. Um, this was in the days when the Board of Pharmacy controlled the sale of prophylactics, a prophylactic tester, a rubber tester if you will. Um, there were standards that said um, a uh, prophylactic, a, contra a uh, condom had to be able to hold, be, had to be able to hold some not even totally realistically biological volume of air. It had to hold like two or three quarts without bursting. Um, and the Board of Pharmacy would occasionally pick up samples from a pharmacy, put them on this machine, and measure the amount of air it took to make them burst. And they had to be minimal at a particular volume. If they failed the test, then the pharmacist, they had to go back to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist had to discard all the prophylactics that he had in stock with that, with that date on them. So for, the Board of Pharmacy did that for years, and then replace this machine with a water test, which I won't get into. Um, but that was stopped when Dean Marianne Cota Kimball was on the Board of Pharmacy, was president of the Board of Pharmacy, caught them testing rubbers and said, let's change the law. This is ridiculous. They were testing the rubbers <clears throat> by filling them with a quart of water or something. <clears throat> okay, in the corner here uh, are a potpourri of things that uh, um, I will tell you right now that there is a beam of balance in there, in this box here, which you cannot see. There is a beam balance here. Um, I should tell you that, that some people will refer to these things as scales, but in the pharmaceutical world, we refer to, the, to anything that measures weights as a balance. A scale is the, is the thing on which you read the thing. For example, you drop a penny in here and this needle spins around. This is the scale, the thing that weighs you. I have no idea what they would call it. In pharmacy, the weighing device, the weighing uh, instrument is called a scale, a balance. So we have back here a pharmaceutical balance. I don't know if you can see it, but I get out of the way. That mahogany colored thing on the second shelf is more of a balance. Another balance. Um, there is a device here for wetting labels. Pharmacists used to have glue. Uh, water soluble glue on the backs of their labels as opposed to the peel off labels they have today. They would put water in here and they would run the label over there, it would wet it, which was far superior than the technique many pharmacists used when affixing labels to a container, and that was to lick it. Um, that was more sanitary. What you have up here, uh, that stack in the upper right hand corner of this shelf at the top, on top of the uh, file cabinet, are probably 30, 40, 50, maybe more, packets that we handed out during the centennial celebration of the School of Pharmacy uh, in, in 1972. Any attendee came and got that packet. I think I've previously described it. There's more of those here. Um, and then miscellaneous slides from various uh, people. I have no idea what the slides are. When I was given a collection of 300 slides, I did not have the interest or the time to go through it. I was simply told they were of picnics, of faculty, of various uh, events involving the School of Pharmacy. Then you have the white thing on the corner there, on the second shelf, down a vaporizer of the era. Um, and all these books along here are catalogs from the School of Pharmacy going back to its founding. Uh, I think they go back as far as 1878. We were actually founded much earlier than that, six or seven years earlier. But I think they go back, and if you open them up, it'll tell you what it costs to go to school, what courses you were going to take. And as I think I may have said previously, some of the earliest ones have on them the name of the California Pharmaceutical Society because 
You may remember from a previous tape that I said we all hopped out of the same barrel. The California Pharmacists Association, the Board of Pharmacy, and the, and the California College of Pharmacy all came out of the same group of people. And so therefore they saved money by jointly publishing um, at least a school of pharmacy or college, California College of Pharmacy and State Board of Ph and uh, California Pharmacists Association booklets. Um, more further on down are um, alumni, UCSF Alumni Association newsletters and then a balance and then I have no idea what's down at the bottom of this mess but that basically is what is contained over there. Over on our shelf here uh, to the to the wall there you will see again more bottles positioned there for no reason other than at the time I got them I had no place other than to put them. If you then below the uh, models of uh, pharmacists in various um, poses and uh, immediately below it is a another balance what is known as a torsion balance that's the kind we use in the School of Pharmacy laboratory that taught compounding until 1968, when it was pre uh, when those were replaced by a more modern edition of a torsion balance, which itself has been replaced by more modern electronic editions. Um, so that's a torsion balance. You would find one like that in a number of pharmacies. Most pharmacies had to carry a balance, had to have it on hand, even if they didn't do compounding. They had to have it on hand and. Um, and so therefore you will find that one, it, either it or a Tremner very sensitive balance, I can weigh down to uh, roughly 110 milligrams uh, accurately within plus or minus 5% error. Um, and then we have another show globe and so on. Over here is nothing that you really want to get into, it's just a lot of graduate cylinders. Graduates, again we call things that you measure things in pharmacy, conical cylinders or graduate cylinders. Graduate meaning they have graduations. And these are just the ones that came out of our laboratories when I, when I decommissioned the laboratory. Beakers, that's not a graduate cylinder. This is, uh, this is an eight ounce. Uh, or a double scaled, meaning it has it in metric system as well, a 250 milliliter uh, cylinder in which pharmacists would would measure liquids. This particular one is the shape as opposed to the cylindrical shape you all are familiar with because this is what pharmacists would sometimes use to mix solids with liquids. They would put the solid in the bottom and they would pour liquids on top and then stir it. That's why you will see this etched bottom. Uh, the bottom is etched from a generation or more of pharmacy students uh, using a glass rod down there. <clears throat> and the reason it's wide at the top is because you get a better <clears throat> swirling action. These came in various sizes all the way down to about one ounce or 30 milliliters. So they went down even below that. 15 milliliters, I think. Then this miscellaneous Wedgwood uh, pestles. I don't know why I've got more pestles than mortars. I, actually, I do know why. Over the years, ph pharmacy students would break a uh, a mortar. A mortar is the device you grind things in. This is called a pestle and they would break them because they'd get a little anxious and punch a hole right through the bottom with this thing. Uh, in their first, you know, they'd be crushing something and just punch a hole through. So I can understand how over a hundred and some odd years we collected more of the pestles than we did of the mortars. Um, and they don't make these like this anymore. Uh, to my knowledge they don't. Uh, they're usually solid porcelain. And these are all stained from the various drugs that they used in the room. The file cabinets are by, the, by and large empty. Although they do have bottles of uh, empty bottles of, uh, most of them are empty bottles of old drugs it's, that came out of a museum, not a museum, but a display we had. Some of them incidentally contain amphetamine, uh, although they're empty, uh, because amphetamine used to be you didn't need any special prescription to order or to dispense. You needed a prescription, but you didn't need an, a special prescription to dispense amphetamine in those days. When I was a student, it was treated quite loosely. In the corner here, over here, we have been visited over the years by various guests and they've left us various things. And this is something, as I recall, a scroll we got from the University of Nanjing. Uh, and some miscellaneous other things like that. And I think that completes the tour. If I've not hit everything, I certainly have characterized everything and um, that is in here.